Okay, so I'm here with the hammer, the buzzsaw, Aaron Mate, uh, independent award-winning journalist for his meticulous debunking of Russiagate, and now he's on to debunking the gas attack narrative, the imperialist CIA pro-war narrative in Syria, and he's been the premier journalist debunking that. He's, uh, he's also testified twice at the UN over this, and uh, he's highlighted the whistleblowers, which has been suppressed by the OPCW itself. So uh, I want to show you uh, what Cenk Uger said on Rising. And uh, we'll... your thoughts on the ongoing feud with Jimmy Dore, which I know a lot of our viewers are, are following very closely. Do you have anything to add um, to his most recent, I would say, uh, comments on that issue? Everything he says is over the top, uh, ridiculous. It's lies. He's, I mean, his lies about me are endless. He says, I'm in favor of bombing Syria. I've never said that. He's a preposterous liar. He's a ridiculous liar. By the way, I caught one egregious lie where Cenk just said that he didn't advocate bombing Syria. There's a clip from the Young Turks in 2013 that's been circulating where he does advocate bombing Syria. So Cenk is lying because Cenk is a liar. Did they cross the red line or didn't they? Now, look, I know it's a tough situation, and I've said that about Syria all along, and I know that they're partly buying time here, but the reality is they don't want to go. They were bluffing, hoping that they wouldn't cross the red line, and I know that there was good reason to bluff, because we wanted to make sure they didn't use chemical or biological weapons. But now our bluff's been called, so what are you going to do? Now, let me show you why they don't want to take military action. First of all, the American people have been polled. They don't want to go. 62% say hell no. 24% say yes. Now, I'm partly in the yes category. Here, I don't want ground troops. That would be an absolute mess. But I think if we drew a red line and we said, hey, listen, we, we're going to set a precedent not to use chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons, and, and a dictator has crossed that line, I think using our air force is a significant possibility, and we could you know, knock down their entire fleet probably fairly quickly and efficiently, thereby giving the rebels a much bigger advantage. Do you know who the rebels are? First of all, there he is. There he is advocating for bombing Syria, using our air force to knock out their air force. And then the rebels, it would strengthen them. Do you know who the rebels are that he's talking about? Al-Qaeda, al-Nusra. That's who he's talking about. Islamic terrorist extremists. That's the rebels that Jenk wants to empower. He's so uninformed about it he doesn't even know that's who he's cheering on so right jimmy by the way when it comes to that specific allegation of a chemical attack in 2013 this is the one where obama almost bombed syria the reason he didn't bomb syria as seymour hirsch the legendary reporter later revealed is because u.s intelligence came to him and said we don't have the intelligence that the syrian government was guilty and in fact we have a lot of intelligence pointing to this attack being staged by the quote unquote rebels. That's what US intelligence knew at the time. Obama was told that the intelligence was not there, that Syria was guilty, and that's why he didn't bomb Syria. All this was reported in two really important articles by Seymour Hirsch in the London Review of Books. Uh, since, since then, more reports have come out showing that Turkey knew that, the, that, uh, that Al Qaeda in Syria was getting sarin from sources inside Turkey. So there's plenty of evidence for this. And so, even in a case where Jenk was lying about the fact that he didn't advocate bombing Syria, that clip shows that he did, he also at the time was doing so on the faulty premise that Syria was guilty. Because again, all these chemical attack allegations make no logical sense. None. It's very clear who they benefit. Yeah, these, if you believe these stories, they only benefit American intervention. Yeah. So, so there's that. So, so the reason why I bring that up is because you tweeted this out, that they, the Young Turks have been pushing this imperialism. There they are in white. Uh, Jenks wearing the white shirt. Uh, he's very pure uh, in his imperialism. So for whatever reason, instead of just apologizing to you for calling you paid by the Russians and working for Assad, they bring on this guy who's not a, uh, a serious journalist. Uh, he's more of just a mouthpiece for imperialism. And Anna introduced him. Well, here's what you said. Wow, for some reason, TYT's attempt to dismiss the OPCW Syria cover-up scandal featuring a guest who has produced a grand total of four paragraphs on the topic who thinks he can dismiss the world's top chemical weapons inspectors, toxicologists, isn't a hit with their own audience. So on that video that they try to do to, to dunk on Aaron, they bring in this guy from Brooklyn. Not, 
The first thing he says is, I'm not based in Syria, as Aaron and Anna said. Anna introduced him as a Syrian-based journalist. <laughs> he goes, I'm not based in Syria. I'm in Brooklyn. <laughs> so, And they got ratioed by their, their own people. So they're, look at the ratio. That's 1.2 thousand dislikes to 872 likes. That's not good for a, for a channel with 5 million subscribers. First of all, nobody watched the goddamn video. So who are you even doing this video for, the Young Turks? Because your own you've cultivated an audience that isn't interested in this and now we know why because you are completely pushing the cia narrative on this that's why no one's turning to you for this information and the people who do stumble onto it fucking ratio your ass your own viewers okay. to me by the way you know what's so funny about that i mean many things funny about that video but here's one more irony so again they're obviously doing this as you said to try to like diss me because they refuse to apologize for lying about me, for smearing me in their McCarthyite meltdown. So they're obviously doing this, covering this scandal that originates three years ago. They've never co covered before. They're bringing this guy on now to try to like somehow uh, cast doubt on my reporting. But guess what? They don't address a single claim that I've made. Nothing. Like I've, written, I've written 10 articles on the topic. They instead just bring this guy on to uh, basically read questions that he's, at least he's written some of them. We know that because we showed the last segment we did on this that that Jenk asked uh, the guest a question that was written on a faulty premise that this guest has pushed before. This guest has said that uh, somehow the OPCW contradicted the U.S. narrative because he was saying that the U.S. narrative was that Syria was guilty of a sarin attack, but that the OPCW said that it was a chlorine attack. We showed that the U.S. narrative all along was primarily that this was a chlorine, chlorine attack. attack. And Jenk was so... Uh, careless and so determined just to try to like score points by doing this and try to own me. He didn't even fact check his own guest. So but just funny that in trying to like do this like sort of passive aggressive way of getting back at me for their own refusal to apologize for slandering me, they ended up not addressing a single thing I've ever written. And that's a pretty good indication that they can't challenge my actual views and the actual arguments here. They instead try to uh, uh, frame this issue on their own terms, which means ignoring all the basic facts about the OPCW scandal, which we went over last time I was on so, your show. So now the reason why I'm bringing all this back up, people may be watching, like, why are you bringing this back up? Because another person, the D.C. bureau chief of The Intercept, the billionaire-funded Intercept, who we've showed you as a bad faith actor before, 100% Ryan Grimm, um, wants to ruin his reputation even more by now coming in and pushing the same lie that Jank Uger and Anna Kasparian are pushing. And why is he doing that? Because he's, his job is to run interference for his friends and his boss, which is Jank Uger at the Young Turks. So he's a, he works with the Young Turks, and so he's decided, instead of going out and writing an article about the Syria gas attacks, he decided to try to disparage Aaron on Twitter. So watch this. He goes, the implication that the strike would be justified if there had been a chemical attack is weird. Taking the evidence seriously doesn't mean you're an imperialist. So this is Ryan Grimm making stuff up. So what you say is, this is officially ridiculous. Where have I advanced the notion that the strike would be justified if there had been a chemical attack? Which is what he just said. He said the implication that the strike would be justified if there had been a chemical attack is weird. And you say, where did I do that? Inventing that straw man is beyond words. So he just invented a straw man and you caught him. And then you go, taking the evidence seriously means looking at the actual evidence, which you clearly haven't, which it's obvious Ryan Grimm hasn't looked at the evidence. He just wants to defend his boss, Jenk Uger. So you go, the point is that the original probe found no evidence of a chemical attack, but had its findings doctored and censored. The implication of letting that slide is that you're okay with cover-ups. If the intercept silence on the OPCW whistleblowers is an indication, that's a yes. So you got them, right? It's like, uh, you're going to let that slide. You, so you, you, you don't give a shit that the OPCW, there was a cover-up of the real investigation? Okay, no, Ryan Grimm does not. Ryan Grimm comes back with this lame thing. He goes, that's a wild and deeply loaded overstatement of what happened. There was dissent from two of the people with various degrees of involvement. So, he, by the way, he's done it again. You know he's done it again. That is a fact. You fucking little bastard. He's he does, does it. He's done it again. 
He you saved it to Gabriel. Dirty bastard, you've done it Where again. So he is trying to pretend that all this here is a, this is a deeply loaded overstatement of what's happened. He's saying that the two whistleblowers that came forward were just two minor players who didn't agree fully with the fuck. It's nothing to see here, folks. There's no OPCW cover-up, and Aaron Mate's making something out of nothing. That's the D.C. Bureau chief of The Intercept who has no idea what he's talking about at all. He knows he doesn't because he's read nothing on this, but he wants to somehow find a way to defend Jenk Uger and Anna Kasperian's horrible journalism on this and somehow discredit the gray zone and Aaron Mate. It's not working. I always think that he's going to have an ace up his sleeve, Ryan Grimm. He never no. does. He no. So you come no. back with The Intercept has published five articles promoting the Trump administration narrative on Duma. They've done zero articles on the OPCW leaks that undermine it and expose a major cover-up. Here, Ryan reduces that cover-up to dissent from two of the people with varying degrees of involvement. Now, that's stunning. Why do you think he's doing this? Well, you know, it's funny, Jimmy. This is really ironic. And this is, uh, this is again, a case where Jimmy Dore is right. And you can actually laugh at me a little bit here because we've previously on your show debated about people who work in adversarial progressive media who say nothing on the most uh, consequential, on the, on, the, on the issues that require some courage. So for some political courage, it's very easy to be good on Palestine. Great. And it's great that you are. But it takes courage to be, for example, uh, to not toe the line on Russiagate, because that was the dominant liberal narrative for four years. And if you didn't go along with that, you'd be smeared as a Trump apologist, a Russian apologist, all these things. OK, so you and I have talked before and I've defended people like Ryan Grimm who say nothing on things like Russiagate or on the OPCW serious scandal. Because I've said, look, not everybody can be Jimmy Dore or the gray zone. People have to feed their families. There are limited opportunities. There's limited space for genuine adversarial journalism. So I've actually defended people who say nothing, like Ryan Grimm. The irony here is that Ryan Grimm decided to insert himself into this discussion on the side of the pro-war narrative. Instead of just saying nothing, which you know I, I, I wouldn't respect, but I could at least understand, I understand that if you start to weigh in on, on actual controversial issues that where there are consequences for weighing in on them, like, for example, the Young Turks are going to smear you and claim that you're paid by Russia. OK, I can understand why someone could look at that and say, you know what, it's not worth the energy and time for me to weigh in on this issue. And I just want to keep my head down, do my work, uh, provide for my family. I, I can understand that. Again, it's not my position, but I understand it. In this case, Ryan Graham decided to come in firmly on the side of the Young Turks pro-war narrative. And when I say Young Turks, I really mean the middle-aged McCarthyites. I shouldn't call them the Young Turks. So that's what that's what Ryan Grimm did. And he ch tries to, and in the process, the problem with him doing that is now he opens up criticism of his own outlet. Because The Intercept, which is founded on supporting whistleblowers and challenging the national security state, in the case of the OPCW cover-up scandal, this major deception with a trove of leaked documents, They've taken the side of the national security state and they've refused to even acknowledge the whistleblower's existence. So as I pointed out wow. in that tweet there, they've published five articles promoting the Trump administration's narrative that Syria was guilty of a chemical attack, okay? The last one was in February, 2019. A few months after that came the OPCW leaks showing that the investigation was censored and that the actual inspectors who went to Syria found no evidence of the chemical attack, okay? Since then, The Intercept has done zero, zero journalism on those leaks. Zero. Zero. And now Ryan comes in to not only uh, take the side of the Young Turks, but somehow try to defend his outlet, ignoring the whistleblower's existence. And I said to him, The Intercept is not even at the level of the Iraq War era New York Times. Because at least the New York Times, after promoting the phony WMD narrative, at least eventually, when there was so much evidence coming out, they couldn't ignore it anymore, so they acknowledged it. The Intercept is not even at that minimal level of integrity. They've refused to acknowledge the OPCW whistleblower's existence, which is just complete journalistic malpractice. And he spent a lot, a lot of time wasting both of our time trying to defend that. And I'll show you, he, he keeps trying to defend it. So here you are, you say, you say, you're pointing out how Ryan, he's trying to reduce the OPCW cover-up as dissent from two people with varying degrees of involvement. So, oh, yeah. And by the way, Jimmy, one of those people 
is the key inspector who was the chief scientific coordinator of the Duma mission and wrote the original report. And when I asked Ryan, you know, we could save a lot of time. Have you read have the you original read, report? Have you read the, the report? one that found no evidence of a chemical attack no, and got he hasn't. censored? No, he didn't answer. No, he didn't answer. But the, the, the answer is obvious. So why are you weighing in on a topic that you, where you haven't even read the basic minimum about it? And why are you trying to dismiss the whistleblowers if you haven't even read the most basic documents showing the evidence that they collected that was censored? And and he because he I think he likes to be humiliated. <laughs> Some people like humiliation. I don't judge those people. Whatever gets you off. That's what gets him off. That's that's part of BDSM. I get it. You like to be humiliated. It helps him come, probably. I don't know. But he, he here you are ratioing his ass like a maniac. Hundred a thousand and eighty eight likes. He's getting like fifty likes on his here you got forty seven on this one. So he goes, they do suggest meaning the whistleblowers, they do suggest there was no attack, but they say they're open to an investigation. I also don't quite get their point. If there was a chemical attack by Assad, then are airstrikes and regime change the answer? Of course not, but that's the implication of fighting this so hard. No, he's, it's not. No, he's, he's creating a straw he's, man. He's, he's, cra- he's trying to say that we're saying that the airstrikes by Trump would somehow be justified. No. If they're actually, no, no, we're saying that no, uh, there was a cover up. There's allegations of a cover, cover up. up. And and the and the implication of that is that Syria was not guilty. But in fact, this was staged by the death squads that controlled Duma at the yeah. time. And he won't and so acknowledge we need to investigate that. that, which is a scandal. We need to investigate that. And he just won't acknowledge that fact. No, he just no. keeps he, this is what's called muddying the waters. What he's doing yeah. here. This is called muddying the waters and running interference. And it got a total of 47 likes because nobody even knows what the fuck he's really even saying, which happens a (laughs) lot in Ryan Grimm's tweets. He'll he'll admit I'm not really saying anything at all. So watch, watch. We'll do it again. Here we go. You go. I don't know. You could make such I don't know how you can make such a wild statement if you have actually read the leaked documents. Have you read the original report written by the key whistleblower and peer reviewed by four or five others? Or the toxicity minutes where experts ruled out chlorine gas? You're asking Ryan Grimm all these questions, and he comes back with saying the toxicology minutes put together like a year after the meeting by one of the dissenters did not rule out a chemical attack. Do you think nobody will ever check your claim so you can just say whatever? So again, he's just making stuff up. He hasn't read the report. He hasn't read the minutes. He hasn't read anything. He's getting this information fed to him by somebody trying to just to muddy the waters and he doesn't even know I what think he's that's talking. A, I think that's a fair speculation because there's no other way to explain it that somebody is feeding him these talking words we can't prove that obviously but I think it's obvious that that's happening just like it's obvious yeah. that he's not arguing in, in good faith yeah. uh, uh, I can't prove that he's not this stupid but you and <laughs> I know he's not that stupid so the logical conclusion is he's arguing in bad faith because Absolutely. so it would be illogical for us to say he just doesn't understand how things work. He no. does. And he's he by the way, he got this handed to him that the toxicology minutes put together like a year. How does he know that he's read nothing? Yeah, it's, it's totally false. And it's false. Why? Right? Because here's yeah. what you say. You go. Do you think that nobody will ever check your claim so you can just say whatever? <laughs> The tweet you're responding to actually said that they ruled out chlorine gas, which is exactly what they did. And it was written two months later, not like a year. Otherwise, great tweet. So Ryan Grimm, again, he's just getting in in here. He's just getting everything wrong in and he's inventing ways to get things wrong. And why is he doing this? So he obviously got us. This is what happens. They get an assignment to go out, run interference for Cenk Uger. So that's what he's doing. He's running interference for Jenk Uger and Anna Kasparian, just like he ran interference for AOC and the squad not pushing force to vote. And then Justin Jackson comes in and ratios his ass, right? A football player. And, he and lo- then Ryan tries to use a football metaphor <laughs> to try to disprove Justin Jackson. That was so funny. He tried to use a football <laughs> metaphor and then Ryan, and Justin Jackson owned his ass. It's just humiliating to Ryan Grimm, but I'm, I'm starting to believe, no kidding, that he's into it, which is okay. Don't judge people who are into humiliation <laughs> sexually. That's their thing. And 
so it, there's no other reason why he would come in. He knows he's going to get ratioed. He knows he doesn't even know what he's talking about. And he knows you're the premier journalist on this and that nobody has tried to debunk any of your articles, including The Intercept. The Intercept hasn't even written an article on it. And nope. they won't. And we know why. Okay. So here, uh, here's the minutes of the meeting, by the way. Here's the minutes of that toxicology meeting. The takeaway message from the meeting was that the symptoms observed were inconsistent with exposure to chlorine and no other obvious candidate chemical causing the symptoms could be, uh, symptoms could be identified. That's what's in the report. Ryan, who didn't read it. Yeah, Jimmy, just to give people an example of how much fraud occurred in the OPCW investigation, the steps that were taken to erase the actual findings. So this meeting with these toxicologists from a NATO member state happened in June 2018, shortly after the team got back from Syria. And fast forward to you know the final report put up, put up by the OPCW, and this is after the original team was sidelined and taken off the case. The final report has a timeline where they lay out all the key meetings that happened in, in putting together this investigation. Well, guess what they leave out? They leave out that toxicology meeting where these NATO member state experts ruled out chlorine gas. Ah. So not only did they erase the actual finding, not only did they erase the toxicologist's actual conclusion that ruling out chlorine gas, they erased the fact the meeting even occurred. They erased it from history. That's the level of fraud. That's one illustration of the fraud that took place to try to hide the original team's findings. You can't even acknowledge the fact that a certain meeting t occurred because it undermined the narrative that the OPCW decided that it was going to promote in complete uh, violation of what they actually found. And so here's Ryan Grimm doing it again. So he comes back and now he's playing cry bully. So now he's <sighs> now he pretends somehow you're you're insulting him. He goes, your effort to throw out a barrage of insults and attack the qualifications of anybody who questions your blanket claims might fool your followers, but eventually they'll notice you don't answer the questions. What? And and all, all I can say is... Jesus, oh, yeah, stop it again! You please, 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 please. So, Aramate rightly says you're projecting. You've thrown out a series of misinformed claims my way today, all of which I've debunked. Yes. And it's funny to accuse me of not answering questions when you're part of the media cover-up contingent that has refused to even acknowledge this whistleblower story. Yeah. Yeah. It's just such I, a joke. I, I, it, this whole debate is such a joke. <laughs> like, you can't er enter into the arena of debate if you refuse to acknowledge the whistleblower's existence. If you think that they're wrong, do some journalism on That's right. what I kept saying to Ryan. And, and, you know, I said, you know, do an actual story on it. There's been nothing because they can't address this story on the merits. So then it becomes getting bogged down in these Twitter fights and claiming that I'm insulting people and questioning people's qualifications. All I pointed out was that the Young Turks guest is, with, with all due respect to him, he's not <laughs> near, he's not as experienced and knowledgeable <laughs> as the actual OPCW investigators who spent more than 25 years combined with the organization, who actually did the investigation, are actual scientists, and doesn't have the qualifications also of the toxicologist who they spoke with who ruled out chlorine gas. I'm saying he doesn't have their qualifications. I think that's an important thing to point out yes. if you're gonna treat this guy as some kind of expert for yes. 40 minutes on the Young Turks. That's the qualifi qualifications that I'm questioning here, which I think is a pretty fair point. And also, hasn't written a single story on the issue. Has it four paragraphs. It's, it's not amazing. So. He's so there he was defending the bona fides of that guy the Young Turks brought on who has no bona fides. He's never written an article on this. And they brought him on as an expert. And he's not even in Syria. So, Aaron, you say to Brian Grimm, again, the D.C. Bureau Chief of The Intercept, which is why. The, and this is important because we're how, showing you how the media, the pretend lefty media like The Intercept, pushes the pro-war narrative. That's why this is important. This isn't infighting. This is us exposing the imperialism embedded in pretend left-wing media. This is important. And exposing how sophisticated and effective our propaganda system is. That's right. Because if right. even the so-called adversarial websites are being enlisted to promote the pro-war narrative, then what chance is there ever that we're ever going to have a functioning democracy? If even the people who are supposed to be at the mo at the furthest end of the spectrum right. on the you know, left. on the left are going along with the establishment, we're doomed. You know, 
And it speaks to how powerful a propaganda system and how important it is to have genuine independent media like Jimmy Dore in the gray zone. And we're too, we're not billionaire funded like the TYT is. We're not billionaire funded like the Intercept, all right? And we don't have millions of people working for us like both those organizations. We're the little guy in this situation. I'm literally in my garage. Aaron works for the gray zone. Uh, he went to uh, Syria. Uh, not He wasn't funded by Jeffrey Katzenberg to do that. <laughs> And he wasn't funded by MSNBC or a billionaire, Pierre Omidar. Uh, so I just want to show what you said to Aaron, to, to Ryan Grimm. You said, I've published 10 articles on this OPCW cover-up, and no one has written a single rebuttal. The Intercept is the perfect place for that. It's yet to publish a single article on the OPCW leak since they emerged. That's crazy, right? This is a great opportunity for Ryan and The Intercept to weigh in on such an important topic. There you are imploring him if you care so much enough to come and try to disparage me on a Twitter thread and you're the D.C. Bureau Chief of The Intercept. Why don't you write a fucking article on it? Then I can show how you're full of shit. And they won't. Because they'll know you'll debunk them. but and, and then you say, since Ryan has decided to cast his lot with the TYT crowd here, I think he should take the natural step if he believes what he says. Commission his go-to Duma expert, Patrick Hillsman, to write the definitive article for The Intercept on why the whistleblowers are wrong. So he was just defending that guy, Patrick Hillsman, the guy the Young Turks brought on from Brooklyn, uh, he was just defending this guy, meaning Ryan Grimm was defending him. And you say, well, why don't you have that guy write the article for you if, he's such, if he knows so much and he's qualified? And then Ryan Grimm says, the idea that toxicologists are the final word on what specific of effort somebody would make to try to survive a bombing is also weird. Like, it's fine if they have to take on that. But that, what in the fuck is he doing? What is that? I've never seen a case where people who are so uninformed feel so just at ease dismissing the expertise of top scientists on such a specific issue that they studied. I mean, yeah. the OPCW had the evidence yeah. and that was shared with the people who did the investigation and those who they consulted with. And you can see their work. After the original team was sidelined, then came a whole bunch of unsupported conclusions. But actually, a lot of that work, we can't even judge for ourselves the merits of. We can see what the original team looked at here and why they concluded what they did. And here, Ryan, because he hasn't, I don't think he's read, again, the original again, document. he hasn't. Is just coming up with a scenario that can justify ignoring the conclusions of NATO member state toxicologists who ruled out chlorine gas as the chemical that killed those victims in Duma. It's very, it's very weird. Uh, so, again, Ryan, if you know so much about this and you cared so much about this, why not write a fucking article on it? Yeah. Or why not assign it to somebody and you edit it for them? Why yeah. don't you hire Patrick Hillsman to do it? You're the D.C. bureau chief. What, we they, have, and they have endless money, Jimmy. They can do whatever they want. He says he's not the foreign editor. That's not true. If you wanted to make it happen, he could, he could, he could make this happen in a day. The, the fact is, as we talked about before, I mean, uh, there are dumb propagandists and smart propagandists. Smart propagandists who want to advance in U.S. media by promoting the establishment narrative, they know that they can't touch this story. That's why a recent book by Joby Warwick of The Washington Post, all about Syrian chemical weapons, it's called Red Lines, doesn't even mention the OPCW whistleblower's existence because he knows that he can't open up that Pandora's box. Once you do, once you acknowledge the fact of the whistleblowers, you have to contend with their facts. And the facts here are overwhelming, that their investigation was censored and that their evidence uh, was that there's no... Uh, evidence of a chemical weapons attack by Syria. So most people just avoid the issue. Ryan decided to weigh in, and now he's just, com con you see in this, in our exchange, just this endless effort to double down and double down. It, it was, it was very tiring. Ryan Grimm is like if spoiled Sherry became a person. <laughs> Brian, Brian Grimm, he, he's that, he's the kid in school that would push somebody, and then when they pushed him back, he would tell the teacher. That, that's who we, so here's what Caitlin Johnson says. Ryan Grimm, you should probably you probably should not comment on issues about which you've read nothing besides Bellingcat tweets. Nice. What, you, know, Jimmy, you know what? Which raises a very interesting tie, because there is more of a tie between The Intercept and Bellingcat than just Ryan Grimm possibly reading their tweets. The Intercept hired Bellingcat. No. 
to give it workshops. No! And Be- Belling, Yes, and Bellingcat, for those who don't know, is a, basically, it's a NATO troll farm. They take money from the National Endowment for Democracy, which is a which CIA, is a funded CIA thing. cutout, basically, for regime change. They take money from uh, the British government and British government-affiliated entities. One British government agency, or a, a study commissioned for the British government, privately said that Bellingcat is somewhat discredited because they're basically willing to produce propaganda for anybody willing to pay. That assessment got leaked, so that's how we know about it. But basically, and as we reported at the Gray Zone, Max Blumenthal did, Bellingcat even partners in UK government propaganda operations. So that's Bellingcat. And Bellingcat has been used as a proxy to try to dismiss the OPCW whistleblowers. We've caught them in all kinds of deceptions. Uh, first, they published a fake letter, basically, that they said was sent to the key dissenting whistleblower and which somehow undermined all of his concerns. We exposed at the gray zone that this letter that they claim was sent to him was never actually sent, and we exposed the actual letter. Then we exposed that Bellingcat was having someone outside Bellingcat, we don't know who exactly, someone outside them writing their questions and uh, and giving them material which contained typos. And the reason we could expose this is because we saw that their typos matched the typos of somebody who was putting their stuff out much, months earlier. And Bellingcat never explained who exactly is writing their questions and ah. fraudulent material. But so we've caught them in all kinds of things. And there's a tweet from Elliot Higgins, the founder of Bellingcat, where he brags. He's trying to like somehow like rebuff claims that he's a tool of the British government. So he says that the uh, that Bellingcat has received more money from the British government than it has from sorry, Bellingcat has received more money from the Intercept than it has from the British government. No okay? kidding. Yes. 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 So The Intercept hired Bellingcat for some workshops. And then when The Intercept did its last article on Duma on this whole thing, they did it right before the OPCW investigation came out. So a few months before the leaks exposed the fraud, they published this long article by James Harkin, which uh, was interesting because it actually showed new evidence that the hospital scene in Duma was staged, which also was the conclusion of a BBC producer named Riam Dalati. But despite that, despite reporting, that the hospital scene was essentially propaganda, Harkin still tried to advance this notion that the a chemical attack by Syria really did happen. Yeah. How many times, Jimmy, have you heard of a massacre happening where 50 <laughs> people are killed and it's on video? You have video of the dead bodies. People say, you know what? Okay, sure, we have the, the dead bodies on camera, but just to make sure that people really believe us, let's go stage a hospital scene yeah. to make sure that people believe us. It's so fucking dumb. But that is the official line of The Intercept. And this article by James Harkin in The Intercept that advances this ridiculous theory, this ridiculous notion that both a hospital scene was staged, but yet the attack really did happen, also cites Bellingcat as some kind of legit authority on the issue. Even though Bellingcat has no scientific credentials as well. It's a recurring theme with these people, right? So Bellingcat has been used as a trusted source by The Intercept, and The Intercept has even hired Bellingcat to give it workshops. That's the Bell and Cat intersection here. Uh, I love what Adam Kern says. This is why people think you argue in bad faith, Ryan Grimm. I try to assume good intentions with you and take you seriously, but this type of shit makes it hard. You go, it's already bizarre and frankly shameful enough that our adversarial media won't touch one of the biggest cover-up scandals ever. Seeing you now twist yourself into pretzels to distort it and minimize the brave whistleblowers who brought it to light, it's jaw-dropping. You're talking to Ryan Grimm from The Intercept. Until The Intercept has the guts to cover this story, you should at least have the self-awareness to not try to minimize it. And I just want to... Sh- yeah. and in fact, you know what, Jamie? I was, I was actually being polite. Yes. He should have the self-awareness to shut the fuck up That's on right. the story. That's right. If you're not going to do the minimal step of reporting on this key issue, yeah. especially after you advance the pro-war line that is undermined or at minimum challenged by all these leaks, then who are you to talk about it? You uh, shouldn't even talk about it. The only thing you should be saying is, when here's when we're going to report on this story. Here's when we're going to end our silence on two years of ignoring one of the biggest pro-war deceptions since the Iraq war. I mean, it's, it's such a major scandal. He's somehow rationalizing, saying zero about it. It's because Speaks that's his where job. where our adversarial media is at. It's, uh, it's a self-parody. Yeah, I mean, The Intercept is not adversarial media. We, we see what's going on. Uh, they're funding Bellingcat. Uh, and, they, and they won't cover the story. So there you go. And so now, again, Ryan Grimm, I don't know what he thinks he's doing, but a pothead in his garage has been kicking his fucking ass for six months straight ever since he ran interference 
for forced to vote and everybody saw it and Justin Jackson owned his ass on Twitter. He keeps doubling down like this. I don't get what he's trying to well I do get. He's paid to do this. This is a it's a good living. He gets six figures, probably a high six figures over at the intercept. And this is what he does. He runs he runs interference for politicians and now other media outlets that are pushing imperialism. <clears throat> and, and he works for a billionaire. Uh, uh, this isn't a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, this is what, here's Patrick Hillsman. So you, Oh yeah. So listen, by the way, Jimmy, this is after I challenged the intercept yeah. to publish Patrick Hillsman. So you challenge, you, 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 you get yeah. that tweet said, Hey, why don't you have Ryan Grimm? Why don't you assign Patrick Hillsman, yeah. the guy who the young Turks brought on to debunk you. And, and it'd be a good opportunity for everybody. Cause Patrick Hillsman's ever published an article on the topic. He's written right. a grand total of four paragraphs. Right. The intercept has written zero on the topic on right. the OPCW leaks. And if Ryan Grimm of The Intercept thinks that Patrick Hiltzman is correct here and I'm wrong, show your work. Publish it. It's a great opportunity. Do it. And so you suggested to Ryan Grimm, why don't you hire him? And Patrick Hillsman says, Ryan Grimm isn't my editor at The Intercept. They already covered Duma in depth. And the reporting debunked Henderson's idea that canisters didn't fall. That, that he's, what is he, what, what article he doesn't, what, what is he, what does he link to here? Well, it'd be hard to link to an article given that all the articles that he's linking to happened before anybody heard Ian Henderson's name. Uh -huh. <laughs> all of the Intercept's articles on the Duma incident, they all came before the OPCW leak emerged. Yeah. yeah. And since they've emerged, they've done zero. So how can you debunk something that you've never even acknowledged? So he's just putting up links and because he, he knows no one will click on them. And... So here's what you say. I say, I told Ryan Grimm that if he really believes Pat Hillsman and TYT's claims that the OPCW whistleblower and me are wrong, the Intercept should commission him to write. It's and Pat's first story huh. on the OPCW leaks and show why. Here's Pat preemptively declining the, so, the opportunity, and I wonder why. So that... And then you say it never stops being hilarious that people who have done zero reporting on the OPCW cover up or in Rhymes Grimm's case work for an adversarial that has ignored it, claim some grounds to try to minimize it. No wonder they refuse to back up their views in writing. Ryan Grimm, just answer this one question and then let's quit wasting each other's time. Do you advocate that your outlet cover for the first time the OPCW leaks? And if not, why not? You want to see his bullshit response? Watch this. This is amazing. He says, sure, I could see the value in a story that looks at what is known and what isn't and which, asser and which assertions are based in evidence and which aren't. But I'm more online than the f I'm more online than the foreign affairs editors, and they probably don't see the point in redoing a three year old story. So he's not, he, it's a three-year-old story. It doesn't matter. I'm going to come in and the Young Turks just did a story about it. I'm over there running interference. It's not, it just, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's not important, except it is important for you to fucking do a thread and spend your afternoon with bullshit trying to fucking say Aaron Matei's wrong. So it does matter. And it matters a lot. And by the way, the story they did three years ago, they never covered this story. This idea that they've already been covered and it's an old story. You never covered it. They only covered it by advancing the Trump administration narrative that Syria was guilty of a chlorine attack. In terms of the story where the actual OPCW investigation found no evidence that, of a chemical attack they didn't cover and their the, investigation was censored, they've never covered that. That's what I mean. They didn't cover the whistleblowers. It's, they're, not, yeah. they're not covering the story. They're not covering yeah. the cover-up. And they're not covering the story that you're covering, nor are they bothering to write a debunking of your story. They're not covering it either way. So, and Ryan Grimm knows that, and that's why this person underneath him says, uh, Syria got bombed because of that, you ghoul. So he's pretending, oh, it's a three-year-old story. It's not, he's trying to diminish it again. Yeah. And, and by the way, the OPCW cover-up is an ongoing story. Yes. It's still being discussed still. at the UN Security That's Council. Right. I'll have a story soon That's on the OPCW Director General, who recently went before the, the UN Security Council, told a whole series of new lies and excuses to avoid addressing the issue. So this idea that it's a three-year-old story and the idea that you can claim that it's old when you've never even acknowledged its existence, it's like it's kind of like if the New York Times had you know promoted the, the pro-war line on Iraq and then you know, some, and then some evidence comes out undermining it. And then say, you know what? Ah, it's an old story. We're not going to revisit it. It's an old story. 
It's so disingenuous. I, and you know the irony about that, by the way? And Jimmy, we, we talked about this actually recently. The last time we talked about The Intercept on your show, we talked about Jeremy Scahill's series on Joe Biden, right? Yeah. And the criticism we had of that was that instead of focusing on Biden's actual crimes now and like major pro-war deceptions and dirty wars that are going on now, especially Syria and Ukraine, where Biden played an active role and they're still ongoing. Jeremy focused on all these things that happened like 40 years ago and don't matter anymore. So now, now Ryan is saying because he's online, he might care about this more, but foreign affairs editors, they don't care about covering an explosive cover up under US pressure at the OPCW that is still ongoing and that the Intercept has never even acknowledged before. It's honestly the most disingenuous thing I can recall a journalist ever saying. It's just like here, he's willing to go this far to try to rationalize ignoring such an important story. Well, this is very, I've never seen anything like it. Well, I have seen something like it. Uh, not not a guy going to this extent to ignore a story, but when Ken Klippenstein pretended that debunking Russiagate was boring. Was boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was really funny. Uh, and he also works at The Intercept, and he's in a scandal today, which is interesting. But here, uh, uh, this guy says, to, because Ryan Grimm says, "Oh, it's a three-year-old story. I guess it could. I guess there could be value in covering it." And this guy says, "I'm a journalist weighing in on a story that I think is so old to cover now that we successfully ignored it." Exactly. Yeah, we ignored it. Well, we successfully ignored it for three years. So why should we cover it? Uh there is currently a war going on in Syria, and these chemical attacks were a huge factor in the world getting involved. Maybe editors should consider that. Imagine if Iraq WMD was never debunked because it was too old of a story. Tired, and as this person says, tired of leftist infighting talk. This is a battle between those fighting for the policies these politicians ran on and abandoned, and people like Dorr who dare to call out paid Democratic op. Oh, this is a different story. So I'll, we'll stop there because there, I was I had a whole other thing set up. I was going to show you how Ryan Grimm gaslit on the force to vote and how he bullshitted you about the funding of the Intercept. Uh, it was it was remarkable. Uh, it was remarkable. I have a we we'll do it the next time we talk. I don't have the bandwidth to keep talking about Ryan Grimm and the intercept. Yeah, that's right enough. Now. Yeah, that's enough. All right. So Aaron Mate, I want to say thank you so much for your, again, award-winning meticulous debunking of pro-war narratives and your uh, exposing cover-ups and conspiracy theories. We appreciate you being a conspiracy analyst on this show because <laughs> that's what we do at this show. We are conspiracy analysts and uh, we're debunking all this, and we're showing you who's arguing in good faith and who's not. And there's no way that uh, Ryan Grimm is as dumb as he pretended to be in that thread. So the logical conclusion is he's in, it's another example of Ryan Grimm being paid six figures to obfuscate and actually it misinform the people who follow him. Isn't that amazing? Like your whole thing is your integrity, your credibility, and your honesty. And he, on, on a regular basis, throws that right out the fucking window. That's all you have as a journalist. But Exactly. But, and, but it doesn't matter because he's going to get that billionaire check no matter what. All right, Aaron. Thank you. By the way, at the very end of our exchange, he made some indication— it was a bit ambiguous, but some indication that he will actually undertake to do something on this OPCW no. story. So I'm going to hold no. him to that. We'll see what he actually does. He, of course, didn't say when, but he did give some indication that he will do that. So we'll see what he does. I'd love to. I, love, I can't wait to see what he comes up with. What, what he comes up with, whether that's him doing something himself or commissioning someone else, whatever. I don't care. I just think if you actually think you're right about this story, uh, then then show your work. And let's assess it on the facts. That's all I've been asking for from the beginning. And again, the bright spot of the middle-aged McCarthyites at the Young Turks attacking me on this story is that they've helped bring it to light, this explosive OPCW story, and any attention that can, ha that can be brought to this story, which all the rest of the media has ignored. Democracy Now!, the only time that they, br that they covered it was two years ago, and they brought in a guest who minimized it and who later doxed one of the whistleblowers. Uh. The Intercept hasn't even acknowledged it. You know, mainstream media, of course, it got one line in passing in the New York Times, actually buried in a profile of Bell and Cat. So the more sunlight on this story, the better, because this story needs to be heard. It exposes just the lengths that our governments will go to lie to us to justify war and sanctions on places like Syria. It shows the corruption of our media in refusing to acknowledge it. So thank you to the middle-aged McCarthyites and to Ryan Grimm 
for your sloppy efforts to weigh in on this story because on the plus side, although it's been annoying, it's been grueling to have to deal with such bad faith people, at least they've helped bring attention to such an important story. And like all the people who debunk the U.S. imperialist narrative in Syria, Aaron is being paid by Putin, Assad, and he's probably a neo-Nazi sex harasser. So just so you know, those are the people. All right. We'll see you later, buddy. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jimmy. All right. See you. Then check out uh, your camel toe. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, everybody, this is the part where I tell you where all our live shows are, but there aren't any. And then this is why I tell you to join our premium program and get extra content, but nobody's got a fucking job. So just enjoy the video.